D-N-T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. friends with benefits <laughs> speaking of having a good time terry mm-hmm. dayton broke <laughs> the gnt show this is now the david mac <laughs> appreciation <laughs> hour you assholes <laughs> <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much with his purple velvet cape and his crown i thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne i am awesome <laughs> <laughs> Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go nyan 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 nyan. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I'm, say it. I'm gonna pry a little. <laughs> dare you! How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd cramped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show, that's right. And good evening, good morning, good afternoon, happy midday, happy twilight. How are you? Welcome to this GNT supplemental. There she is to my left, your right, wearing her stunning evening gown with her long gloves and her glass of champagne. No, no, that's what Terry. I'm wearing. Not what <laughs> <laughs> Terry. <laughs> Hello. And there he is wearing his uh, baby New Year outfit once again. We can't get him out of it. <laughs> the diaper over the uh, Klingon armor. Ceridium. Kapla. <laughs> and that, that giggle you hear is our ball drown, gown dress wearing Klingon armor wearing all in one author extraordinaire Mr. Tyen himself Keith DeCanado hello <laughs> it is that was so awesome. nice to, ha- to be able to talk to you sir we he love still, having still, you on Keith he still serves you I don't know why um, <laughs> I know first, first things first you said it on the show but congratulations yes uh, congratulations thank you the new book is gonna be no oh that, no <laughs> <laughs> try to trick us <laughs> No, very, yes, I was very happy. Are, I've seen you guys we more all were. than not. Yes. It, it, you should probably explain what you're congratulating me for to people who don't know. So. No, no, we've got new listeners. Let them, let them, you know what, let them read. Let them figure it no. out. No. We feed no. them to I the got sharks. Engaged, exactly. you guys. Yes, what? I got Congrats. engaged. Yes, you did. For some inexplicable reason, she said yes. We're still trying to figure out what's going to happen when she sobers up. I love but. <laughs> She, yeah, by the way, Red is, in, Red is in the room with me, and she just screamed, I lost my mind. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Here's the question. Did she take out a life insurance policy on you before she said yes? Uh, no, but there's still time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just so happy for you. I really am. I'm happy for you both. It's um, wonderful news, and I'm glad that, uh, you know, we we got to live a little bit vicariously through you because you got to take a little trip down south. Tell me, was it wonderful? I've never been to Key- down to the Keys. You went to the Keys, right? Went to Key West, yes. And it was magnificent. It was, uh, I um, I first went to Key West in 93, uh, went several times throughout the 90s. Um, I actually, uh, my most recent book uh, is a sh- collection of short stories that all take place in Key West. They're uh, urban fantasy stories set there. Um, ah. uh, yeah, the, the, book's, the book's called Ragnar Rock and Roll. It's out now from Plus One Press. And part of the trip was, the point of the trip was to um, uh, do a little extra research there. Uh, That's awesome. Extra stories, cool. which, which means I can, you know, write the trip off. No, I just, I have to ask because one of my dreams is to just go there one day. But um, did you happen to stop by the Hyatt at all down there? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I need to go there. But my husband works by the Hyatt. Hyatt. I understand oh. it's the immune uh, here beautiful i want to go we, we i tend to stay in bed and breakfast when i'm there oh nice right on and, and now uh, the first time you went there is that when you came across on the raft from cuba is that how that <laughs> <laughs> anyway the <laughs> actually, legit question <laughs> it's a legit question <laughs> no it really is a legit question uh, this is why i'm ignoring it giving it the uh excellent the, the attention it deserves, deserves. just move things. on Exactly. Well, no, we all know that the real, (laughs) the reason why we have you on is not just to celebrate Ragnarok, but also, uh, let me, let me hear, how is the graphic novel coming along or the, uh, the, the, the series, correct? Dragon Precinct? Oh, that, it's not a graphic novel. It's a, it's a series of novels. 
series. Thank you. Oh, I was, I was going to say it's more than that. For those new to the show, oh, Terry, Terry has imbuing in, in, in champagne tonight. So I'm just on my first glass too, which sucks. I need apparently I need more. Apparently, yeah. Um, and 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 why aren't you sharing? The um, I got mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, the 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 precinct series is still going strong. I'm actually just I just finished up Griffin Precinct, which should be out at the end of this year. Uh, that's the fourth book in my fantasy police procedural series. I love this idea. I just love this idea. So I just started to sub. So yay for me. Cool. Okay, by sub you mean in downloading? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Well, there's another definition to that. But there are there are several actually. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Pro- probably none of which we can discuss on a family podcast. But um, <laughs> we have an explicit the, uh, rating, Keith. You should know that. You oh, know. all right. Well, then then we're 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 fine. <laughs> the um, uh, they're now Griffin Precinct is the fourth novel in the series. I also had a short story collection now called Tales from Dragon Precinct. Uh, right. Dragon Precinct was the first book, and then there was Unicorn Precinct and Goblin Precinct okay. and Griffin Precinct. Uh, that will be followed what will by what will finally be the 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 last book in the series, which Mermaid Precinct. At which point I will I will have run out of priests. <laughs> Because <laughs> the town only has five, um, and also that'll that'll give me six books. That's a good that's a good run. And um, I don't want to I don't want to. It's always better to quit while you're ahead, or at least where you think you're ahead, rather than overstay your welcome. And I think uh, I think six books, you know, five novels, one short story collection. That's a that's a good solid body of work and uh, that I'm quite proud of. So um, that's really really cool because I I really did just start downloading the uh, the first book. So I just started cool. to download the first book, and um, maybe I it, misunderstood. It any day so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have to admit, either I'm, I am in the middle of three books right now, which is bad. Ah, okay. so I can get I'm not that. But, uh, Mike, do you want to start off the discussion that we have, which is, you know, the Star Trek end of things? Yes. Oh, right, um, that old thing. <laughs> yes. Well, first off, first off, I, I want to say that I'm a huge fan of your IK Scorcon series that you, you had written. Um, wonderful, wonderful stories. And I am so pleased to hear that you have returned to, to the Klingon way. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, Klingon Art of War. Is that... Yes, that is the title. What can you tell us about about, about it? Uh, not a lot. Um, <laughs> we want we want there to be some surprise. Uh, mm. Basically, it, it's going to be a big hardcover coffee table type book. Uh, it's coming out in May of 2014. Uh, it's actually being... The book was put together by Becker and Meyer, who are the same people who did the Rise of the Federation book and How to Speak Klingon and a bunch of others. And they're also and, the ones that are doing the, the, star, the star charts, the new uh, uh, Stellar Cartography book, correct? I think so, yeah. Um, uh, but it's actually, but it's being published by Simon & Schuster uh, as part of their you know, line of, of Trek books. Uh, it's not a novel as such. It is um, I, I've, I've been jokingly calling it a self-help book, it, which it kind of is. Um, <laughs> the, the it, it's, you know, a guide to living, you know, a proper Klingon life, and it's not it's not just applicable to warriors. It's supposed to be applicable to anybody. Uh, the, there, it's set up with ten precepts on, on you know, how to live your life like a proper badass Klingon and each of those precepts is spelled out with various anecdotes from Klingon history uh, those are pulled from some of them are pulled from episodes of the show some of them of the various TV shows and movies some of them are pulled from uh, novels and comic books and some of them I completely made up from scratch for the book <laughs> so essentially what this awesome. is is a mix between the art of war by Sun Tzu and maybe the I Ching yeah, if the I Ching used batlets instead of dice yeah <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that is cool. But it was it was I, a lot of fun to do. It was an interesting challenge because it isn't it is like I said it isn't a novel. It's it's kind of a nonfiction book except of course it's still fiction because it's you know Klingons who you know aren't actually you know real. So um and it, did you hear and that Michael? Did you hear that Klingons <laughs> are not real? Shut up Romulan. They, exactly, they're not like Romulans. <laughs> right, Romulans who are, are real. completely completely real. Yeah, right. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, yes. <laughs> but the the it, it's. It's pulling from it, the advantages, of course. I don't have to actually go into you know find historical examples. I can just make them up. Yeah. Um, although I was perfectly content to use, like I said, there's plenty of stuff from uh, various uh, bits of source material. But it's a very different kind of book. There's no you know it's not a book with a plot. It's a it's it's an, it, it really is an advice book in a lot of ways, which I've never done before. So this was a this was a really interesting challenge. Uh, you know, it's a type of book I have not done before, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, and hopefully people will like it. I mean, uh, you know, the, the the manuscript's been approved. So um, my editor was happy with it. Uh, CBS Paramount was happy with it. Uh, I'm happy with it. Everybody's happy. So hopefully the readers will also be. I'm sure. I'm I, sure that they will because it's already kind of run its course through the. Uh, when, let's face it. Before you even had an opportunity to, to talk about it, we we had already seen the leaks on Amazon, and we were like, oh, what? <laughs> 
Oh, I've already pre-ordered it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> My copy arrives in May. <laughs> Excellent. So it was. It was a. And and now I'm kind of going to go back to you know the the fact of the matter is we haven't seen you in the Star Trek universe in quite a while, and we need. I'm I'm curious how were you how were you approached how were how did you get I, involved? It was. Uh, I got an email from the editor at Becker and Meyer. Um, I was actually recommended by Dayton Ward. He was. Uh, they had talked to him about it. Uh, he didn't really have time to fit it in his schedule and he said well you should call Keith so they did um, and uh, I said yes for reasons that should be fairly obvious and uh, <laughs> uh, you know we worked out we worked out the outline um, and you know went from there it was but yeah it was it was basically as it was as simple as that that's, cool. that's really really wonderful um, we're all very excited ab- ab- about that Again, just because it's yet another kind of uh, another book and another piece of merchandise that you know Star Trek character we haven't seen. We're just so happy to start seeing the flow <laughs> of stuff, of stuff in my Bernadette Peters. It's the stuff <laughs> that we've, we're finally getting to see, and it's it's really wonderful. And I'm, we're just glad to see re involved in it back in. I'm I'm really glad to see me involved with it too. It, it's uh, it, like I said, it was it was a fun, it was a really fun project, and uh, it, it hope one I hope people respond well too uh, now, and it's certainly it's certainly it's fun to play with Klingons again I, I, I've always had an affinity obviously you know for for, for those those bumpy headed bastards and, and <laughs> the uh, uh, it's it's they're a fascinating culture to play around with and there's so much wonderful stuff that's been developed with them not just on screen although God knows they've had you know, probably more than any other species on Star Trek they've they've gotten quite a bit of development on screen yeah mm-hmm. and uh, including you know some of, honestly some of the better Enterprise episodes were ones that, that that dealt with the Klingon stuff. Judgment is one of my favorite uh, favorite episodes. I adore that episode. So do I. And I am not a fan of Enterprise at all. But um, but I can I can watch Judgment over and over. Again. Partly just because it's got J.J. Hertzler and John Vickery in it, and I can listen to this. I could listen to the two of them read the phone book. You know, uh, <laughs> those, those are those are two those are two of the best voices we've got. And uh, you know, getting the getting the two of them to play lawyers was a stroke of genius. You know, these are these are guys who know how to declaim. You know, That's and awesome. the yeah. And there's just been so much done with them, and there's, but there's still so much more to play with. One of the things, one of the things I liked about Judgment was that it gave a, a bit of insight into life beyond the warrior class. Um, and that's something I've tried to, to do in a lot of my Klingon fiction, anyway, is, is deal with the rest of the Empire. You know, the people who are the people who you know who are the Klingon janitors, who are the Klingon cooks, who are the Klingon restaurateurs. The Klingon, Thank you. You know, construction yeah. workers, the the entertainers. Right. Yeah. Entertainers, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, they mentioned we've heard about Klingon opera. Obviously, that means there have to be people who sing it. Um, right. Um, professionally, uh, and not so not everybody yeah. can be a warrior. Exactly, and and the only way you and if everybody is a warrior, then nothing will actually get done. There's no way right. you can construct a spacefaring empire. But I mean, it makes perfect sense that the warriors are the highest caste, you know, or the yeah. the upper classes and the ones who run the joint. Um, but that still leaves the people who do the actual work, you know. Right. Yeah. For that matter, who's the who's the poor bastard who has to clean up the mess hall after they're done eating, you know? <laughs> Aren't they Jack Pui? <laughs> yeah, the lowest rank. Oh yeah. Is what that is. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but still, somebody's got to do it, you know. Very true, very true. It's a dirty job. <laughs> very dirty job. I mean, all that, you know, all that stuff, all the drinks spilled all over the place. See, I always thought they would use a different rock. species when it got down to brass tag, so. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they do, but still. <laughs> but still, again, who's doing that? Right. Yep, yep. Well, speaking of Klingons, you, uh, one of my favorite things that you do is you have, for the last several years on Tor.com, yeah. you did an episode-by-episode review of The Next Generation, and now you're doing Deep Space Nine. Yes. And you just did what, yes, I'm, I'm Romulan through and through, but one of my favorite episodes, uh, d- d- if nothing else, because I've always been a Kang fan. <laughs> uh, it, it, talk about what you're learning or relearning or discovering going through both series like you have been. Uh, and like there's times that you've said in some of your, your reviews, you don't even remember the episode ever have, you know, that you know you saw it, but it, sometimes times they were just so forgettable that literally you forgot. Yeah, there, but, were, a couple, you know, there were a couple of seventh season Next Gen episodes that I had no recollection of whatsoever. Uh, Masks was one of them. Uh, mm-hmm. And not uh, uh, no. Uh, and yeah, once I watched it, I remembered why, probably why I didn't. <laughs> 
Yeah, I yeah, hate that why episode. Why well, I didn't yeah. hate it. I just, I I, it wasn't particularly. Actually, no, masks. I did kind of hate. Uh, Thine own self actually wasn't that bad. Um, it wasn't that good either. But uh, it, it at least had had its good points. Uh, but I had no. There was absolutely nothing in my brain remembering that one at all. And um, you know, the uh, it, it it it's been fascinating. And and in some cases, ones I hadn't watched in so long that there were details I had forgotten. Like, for example, there was a uh, the episode Interface, which is the one that introduced both Matt Sinclair and Ben Vereen as LaForge's parents. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. I, which, was, which was a masterstroke of casting that they then utterly wasted. But, wasted. Um, totally wasted. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was still a masterstroke of casting. You know, the, the, they were the perfect people to play that for those roles. But I had totally forgotten that there was a scene in there, which amusingly was, was actually added because the script ran short, um, of Riker talking about how he reacted to his mother dying, which is a wonderful scene. I had totally forgotten about that. And it was a really good, well done scene. The most interesting thing coming out of the Next Gen rewatch in particular uh, after after going through it for seven years was a greater appreciation of what Jonathan Frakes did well. He was a very limited actor, but within those limits he was really good. Uh, much better than I remembered. Uh, and, and he had some, some spectacular moments on the show, some of which I didn't remember, a lot of which I didn't. Um, and watching them all at once I sort of got a better, better appreciation of it. I also uh, had a much lower appreciation after watching the show of the character of Jordy LaForge who has come across to me as Creeper. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, it just I I I really I I just don't like this guy anymore. Aww. I really don't. Creeper. Yeah. So true. It is such a shame too because it, but it's true. It is so true. He he he. You know, it's not it's not, not Lavar Burton's fault. Well, no, of, not at all. In, t- in terms of his character, it, it, it he doesn't he did not adapt to the times uh, to the modern. Era, era very well. Everything that yes. he, he experienced just make, makes him like one step up from like a sexual offender. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it was really kind of disheartening. Um, yeah. Jord, Jordy would be so addicted like to guy. you porn, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's why he and uh, I always kind of kiss it off as to that's why he and Barkley were such good friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Barkley got better and was in treatment. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. At least he was getting treatment. Now, uh, what are you rediscovering in Deep Space Nine? Because you're in season two now. Um, just a couple of episodes that I didn't remember very well. Like I, uh, one recent. <laughs> Somebody's dog is. Yes, my apologies. I have a dog. by Targ. I have a, I have a dog too. I totally get. It. I walked him before I did this, precisely so this would. Play. <laughs> Although to be mine, fair, mine are with my husband dog. down the hall. Yeah, our 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 dog has developed an inside bark. He sort of swallows it. He goes. <laughs> 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 uh, that sounds like re- my dog Charlie. <laughs> somebody ring, somebody rings the doorbell. Forget it. You know, somebody rings the doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all over yeah, there. that's his job. Um, you know, if you've you've never been to Terry's house, but if her, if the wind blows, her dog. Just go absolutely batshit crazy. That's what <laughs> it's true. It's just what happens when you live in the middle of fucking nowhere. Come on. It's like the helicopter goes over and the dogs are like, woohoo, there's something to bark at. That's what happens. They got to take whatever entertainment they can. Exactly. Dust bunny! <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So we so were what, discussing so what DS9. Were we talking about? Yes, DS9. Yes. Um, uh, there was one episode, uh, Second Sight, the one with, um, which I had totally forgotten that Sally Richardson Whitefield, uh, who later became well known for Eureka that she was the, the dual love interest there I had so little memory of that episode um, when I was editing the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series uh, Andy Mangles and Mike Martin did a story for me uh, which included um, a holographic version of Gordon Sayetic, the, the terraformer who was in that episode ah. oh okay and uh, it was like Sayetic and Carl Sagan and a couple of other you know dead scientists who somebody had put in a, in a holodeck program and uh, <laughs> the my, my memory of Second Sight was so strong, he says sarcastically, that I asked Andy and Mike, shouldn't this guy be a Vulcan with that name? And Andy very gently said, or Mike rather, uh, very gently said, Keith, he was in an episode. I said, really? (laughs) <laughs> Which was embarrassing because usually I was the one <laughs> who remembered that stuff. Um, you know, for, for, for a long time I was the guy people would go to and sometimes still am, you know, and say, hey, which episode did this, that, or the other thing happen? Uh, <laughs> and I had totally <laughs> forgotten this. And then when I, I, I watched the episode again, uh, when the script came to re-familiarize myself, which, again, was so memorable that ten years later, still didn't remember it. <laughs> and when I was re-watching it for, for Stardive.com, 
Uh, it just was not a very memorable episode. Of- wow. Well, I have a question. There, I haven't, I, but just to, to actually answer Nick's question, um, the I haven't been doing DS9 long enough to really notice the same patterns that I was noticing with with Nick. Um, I was gonna I was gonna ask you a question with regards to the patterns you saw in Next Gen, uh, some of which I think we all kind of understand now. Did you really? Uh, it, I don't know. Did you pick up on the same thing I did, and that was that character development for the Next Gen crew really didn't start to occur until after Roddenberry's death? Uh, uh, more or less, yeah. I mean, it was it was something that that happened slowly, if at all, um, and mostly was focused on what became the big three of the show, who were Picard, Worf, and Data. Right. Um, they were, you know, for for all that the intent was with the big three of the show to be Picard, Riker, and Troy, that that changed pretty rapidly. Um, and and those three got plenty of character development even even earlier on. Um, but uh, you know, I, I mean, I I yeah, the, there was there was a lot of the early, the early seasons, uh, particularly the first season was is justifiably remembered as being painful uh, and it was pretty painful to, to, to watch a lot of that again because <laughs> The, the, the biggest up the, the biggest, long ladder uh, code of yeah. honor enough ah. although it had its moments I mean there were some there were some strong episodes in there there was where no one has gone before which is brilliant um, right. I still don't see the problem with, with where no man where I mean uh, with code of honor I don't understand all the backlash <laughs> against that episode I think it's an amazingly <laughs> prescient troll. you are a troll it's such an amazingly bad. prescient and, and a vital look at relationships and how it really should be alright I'm gonna go get more champagne I'll be right back <laughs> Yeah, and and heaven help anyone you date, man. Um, <laughs> well, you, you heard the news, didn't you? What the Enterprise D bridge at Vegas that they they had there the, the set? Uh-huh. How did you not hear? I got engaged on the bridge. Oh, that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, that. Because <laughs> you met Janice at Shirley, right? Right, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked her in Vegas. Okay, that's fitting. She said yes, but you know, I want to make that clear. To you. Well, I, I figured you wouldn't have brought it up if she did. Well, you know, all the all the babes out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But oh, shut it, Mike. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I hope Terry has some extra champagne. Anyway, the, uh, the 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 problem with the first season was that the show, by that point in his life, I think Gene Roddenberry had really kind of started to believe his own bullshit. If you know what I mean. Um, mm-hmm. The 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 whole idea of the, the original series wasn't really utopian fiction as such. It was you know a much more idealized version of humanity. It was humanity that had progressed tremendously. Um, but it was still, yeah, they still had a ways to go. They still, there was still progress to be made, uh, but we had made a great deal as well. I mean, just the sheer fact that you had um, uh, Uhura, Sulu, and Chekhov on the bridge working alongside the nice white American people uh, was spectacularly radical in 1966. And um, throw Spock in there as well, which... Well, that was actually, really I mean, that was, that was less radical because, you know, oh, well, he's an alien. It's the science fiction show. Of course there's an alien. You know, mm. um, that's to almost be expected. But, but having... The the crew not just be a bunch of homogenous white people, uh, very obviously American homogenous white people, is is was a major thing. Still a major thing, honestly. There was a sense that there were still lessons to be learned and, and, and there was still, humanity still had progress to be made. The first season of Next Gen was, came across as that humanity was basically done. We've learned everything, we're perfect now, everything is great, which you know, is, is something you can tell one story about, but not really something that's useful for serial fiction, uh, which is what a TV show show is and uh it really reduced a lot of the possibilities for conflict which is which was a problem so to, to that end the the first season is really you know difficult to watch because it didn't have a lot of the elements you need to actually make good drama you got them eventually um mm-hmm. you know as they figured out ways to to make the setup that roddenberry had work and then ds9 of course you know took it one step further uh beyond that to really challenge the utopia and make it something something that had to be worked on and something that had to be fought for and something that had to be defended, um, because not everyone's going to agree with you on that, and sometimes the people who don't agree with you might win. Yeah, yeah and that was a really big change for for the genre on the whole, for the IP on the whole, to, to actually sit. I mean, it was something that I certainly had difficult time a difficult time dealing with when I watched DS9 for the first time, and um, took me a, quite a bit of time to kind of come to a resolution with mentally, because you always have that, that I, because I am, I'm such an idealist, I think, okay, mm-hmm. there's always there's always a solution there's yeah. always a solution and you know what do you do when you when you feel like you're put in a position when there isn't a solution and that's where I kind of had to kind of go how do you forgive a character like Cisco and I thought wow you know the beauty is is that 
Ah, be good, be good. Um, you do. You end up dealing with that in terms of a Star Trek idealism, and that is, you know, wow, that's a that's a subject that Star Trek got to deal with and never really had before. And mm-hmm. I thought that was really kind of um, unique and interesting and nice to see. Yeah, I, I mean that, that's well always come to terms with it, but it's true. Yeah. I mean that that's the 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 issue, and it's something that the the original series dealt with a couple of times. The the whole idea of situational ethics. That, right. You know what's 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 an act of heroism in a time of war is an act of murder in a time of peace. Um, and and that's that that that's what in the pale moonlight, you know, which I assume what you were mostly referring to. It, it, it is giving Cisco. Yeah. Uh, w- that was what that was all about. Was that you know there that what the ethical compass gets changed when you're fighting a war, when when you're fighting an enemy who is not going to play by the same rules as you. Um, and and there are there are situations where that those actions has to have to be taken. You know. Yeah, and and how do and and, and how does a society that prides itself on being something but deal with the mm-hmm. fact that it had to be something it didn't it didn't think itself as being I thought exactly. that was a brilliant brilliant piece of writing and and something that although I don't like the character you know because I saw him as falling from that you know he's he to me I see him as an extremely tragic character but there, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that he's not an amazing character Right, but yeah, he I, was, the circumstances put him in a situation where he had he had to do this reprehensible thing. Right, he never would have when, done under other circumstances. When I did my DS9 rewatch, one of the things that impressed me the most was the change from a total shithead to one of the best characters ever. That was Julian Bashir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just the gr- if you look, at I love first, his laugh on that. That was cute. well. If you look at first season Julian, he's really oh, he's like a. God, you- to punch him in the nose. Oh, he's, he's a freshman. He's he's like a freshman in high school that for decades has always been an all girls school, and it's the first year that boys are admitted. And yet, by the end of the series, series he has a gravitas about him yeah. that's yeah. just amazing. Agreed. And and it develops naturally. One one of the things that I particularly uh, liked about the show was you know the the like on Next Gen there was very little character movement. Right. Uh, the only person who could be argued to be seriously in a different place from where he was in the show started was Worf. Um, and to some extent, Data. And, you know, Picard went through a lot, but at the end of the show, he was still basically the same person. Right. Um, the, the, the only time that armor ever really cracked was in First Contact, and that was, you know, that one for the three four. But the, he wasn't really changed. Worf was a different person by the end of the show, and, and that, that's why if they had to bring someone from Next Gen over to Deep Space Nine to help, you know, goose ratings or whatever it was they were trying to do there, Worf was the only person who would have worked. You know, I don't think it would have worked if they brought anybody else over. But he was, he was already had halfway to being a Deep Space Nine character already. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the, what was, what, what I really liked about the show was the way the characters did develop. Um, you know, uh, watching the change, for example, in Kira from what she was in the first season, <gasps> some fresh out of the resistance, big chip Angry. on her shoulder. And by, and, right. And justifiably so, too. And yes. by the end of the series, she's helping a Cardassian resistance move. Thank you so much. Just such, that was, I loved that whole idea just as a so full circle I. for her. Right. Uh, and and uh, the, one of my absolute and I'm, I'm, it's going to be a while before I get to it on the rewatch, but it's one I rewatch myself over and over again because it's one of my absolute favorite episodes of any Star Trek show is Tacking Into the Wind. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's the one where the A-plot is um, ends with Damar actually killing <gasps> rather than, than letting her kill Kira, and letting him kill Kira, rather, when they're stealing the Jem'Hadar ship. And then uh, the, the parallel plot with Worf is when he kills Garon. And there's several things I love about that episode, um, but what there's so much, so much of the history of the different characters come comes into play there, um, and it ties together also beautifully, both in terms of the Klingons and in terms of the bajoran Cardassian uh, relationships. Um, and uh, there's it just, and, and I mean, part of part of why it works is because it builds on all that history. I mean, the, the Klingon half of it is basically the conclusion of a of a storyline that had begun nine years earlier in Sins of the Father um, on Next Gen, and and had continued through two shows. And I loved that sense of you know how things had progressed from you know particularly in Worf's case where he basically took it on the chin to preserve the Empire and Sins of the Father to the point where he's basically, you know, telling the Chancellor, fuck you, you're doing this wrong. Um, and, and you know, going and from... And somebody he used to respect, too. I mean, so... Yeah, you, yeah. And you understand the the, the, the the gravitas of that situation is how how much Worf would have had to have hated and loathed what he was he felt like he had to do. I love that episode. And but, and, and just the, the, the progress that, that Kira had made at that point, because, I mean, the first season, first season Kira could never have done what she did in the seventh season. True, uh, very true. And helping out and helping out the Kardashians, you know, and, things and that, if, 
like episodes like Duet, and, oh. and then <sighs> you know the, 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 just the progression of the character dealing with the character of Zial, uh, working with Garrick, even um, all that you know changed her point of view. Probably the, the 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 best example besides Bashir, who went from being the guy you wanted to punch in the nose repeatedly to somebody you could actually respect, was um, Nog. Yeah. <gasps> if, you, if you ever if you ever meet Aaron Eisenberg at a convention, uh, get him yeah. started. Subject of Nog. Oh. <laughs> We not uh, Nog. Aaron and I, I. I actually consider Aaron a friend. We 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 yeah. th- both years at Vegas. We spent you know good times together. Hours, and, oh, hours, yeah. hours. And he is Aaron, such a great, is a great guy. guy. Yeah. And you know Nog in in all of Trek. My my top two favorite characters are both secondary characters from Deep Space my Nine. Too. One is Garrick, and the other is yep. Nog. And yeah. Garrick because favorite. Andrew J. Robinson is just you know so amazing in that role. But Nog because the growth that he went through. And, you know, the two scenes, one where he tells Cisco he doesn't want to be like his father is right. so heartbreaking and, and yeah. you know, just so well done. And then the other is, and, and I think, you know, it, um, It's Only a Paper Moon is a very special episode to me uh, for, for many reasons, uh, because, you know, I watched it right after I came out of Fallujah. And so mm. it, it like hit me right. It, it, it like right in the no field. other. Yeah, right, right in the right field. field. And right in the private parts. Yes. And <laughs> the ending of that, where he's talking about, you know, he's so scared, was just and, and to take an episode and take two, well, a secondary and a third level character, really. Yeah, really. Yeah. And, it was and the he, first time yeah. I think that Star Trek. Well, no, not the first time. I think that Star Trek always skirted the uh, well, especially in TNG, and I'll even admit that. I mean, I think that that the original series was able to touch on uh, some of the deeper meanings of, of war and stuff because of the time it was it was created and it held such a um, an, an, an ulterior motive kind of thing as to what was going on in Vietnam and with the civil rights movement and everything that was going on at that period of time that it really acted as a touchstone for those people who were, were, were trying to find some kind of sense um, in that time where TNG was also doing the same thing, but in the in in the opposite, at a time of of corporate greed and craziness that was going on in the 80s, TNG represented that that antithesis, that complete political correctness, that complete kind of sense of of, of stability when things weren't necessarily in anyone's control. DS9 provided that same kind of opposite ideal, but even more so, took one step further than it, than than either of its two predecessors did by being able to, to look at and look at those horrors of war that we had already been through and and t- especially with Nog's character. I think you're right, Keith. I think it was a he's such an amazing character. And, and TNG, one, sorry, TNG did touch on at least to some extent in Family, which is one of my favorite episodes. Where oh, it was hard basically dealing with the aftermath of, of being assimilated by the board. Well, know, it's, it's also it's, it's also a, a right, and that's also a really good episode. Um, believe it or not, it's also a, an, a really really good episode episode for um, people to have at least a basic understanding of what it's like to be a rape victim. So that one kind of even stretches even further, especially for a lot of, of women who I knew who who are rape victims. So it was a, a, a very, you know, or victims of abuse of, of any kind of situation. Uh, yeah. And even in follow-ups of uh, Chain's Command, same thing. Yeah, although that wasn't really well followed up on. No, it should have. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, what I'm more interested in as a writer is... And, and as, as a consumer of, of fiction, is what happens after the big disaster. It's not a coincidence that um, I have more than once been put in a position to basically, and, and it's always after Dave Mack, because, you know, that's how it yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, wow. it's, yeah, it's yeah. Clean, and basically no, cleaning up a mess that Dave made. Um, you know, I was in, in the SCE series. It was me and a bunch of us uh, <laughs> doing, you know, following up his wildfire story, in which he basically, you know, kicked the shit out of the ship and killed half the crew. And then <laughs> there were there, we did we, we did basically that was our best of both worlds. And then we did four stories that were basically our family. And um, and then again with uh, a time for a time for peace, where I had to bridge the gap between Dave basically doing the most depressing uh, war story you can imagine. And I had to bridge the gap between that and Nemesis. And it was funny. I was one of the things I realized. It's like crap. The beginning of Star Trek Nemesis. Everybody's happy. There's a wedding. <laughs> yeah. They're 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 making bad jokes. You know. They're they're you know Worf's getting drunk and 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 everybody's Data in a, singing a song. Data, yeah. Data sings a song very badly, and everybody's in a good mood. And I've got to write the book that gets from where Dave left off in a time to heal to that. Um, 
no pressure or anything. And <laughs> no then, pressure. Yeah. Um, but the, but again, it was you know the aftermath that tried. And then of course you know my most my most recent one was was being the first of the follow ups to the to the Destiny trilogy, where where what I what I was most interested in looking at was how this you know I knew that other people would deal with how specific crews dealt with. Kirsten dealt with how Voyager uh, dealt with the aftermath. Um, Bill right. Eisner did how ne- how the Enterprise uh, dealt with it, and uh, Jim Swallow did how Titan or was it Christopher? I forget. Whoever wrote the next Titan book, uh, how they dealt with it. But um, that's still I wanted to look at the bigger picture. What? How did this affect the Federation as a, and the Alpha Quadrant as a whole? Right. You know, mm-hmm. what, what did it mean for all the other various people, and and what was it going to mean politically? Because um, that was that. You know, I I wouldn't necessarily have been interested in in the abstract writing the Destiny trilogy and writing the big battle where you know seven thousand board cubes pour into the Alpha Quadrant and the shit out of everybody. Uh, but I am very interested in what happens after that. how they pick up the pieces after that. what what how people deal with the with the post traumatic stress. Well, if there's one thing that I've always appreciated about your work is the fact that you have an uncanny ability to deal with political ramifications of any situation, mm. um, whether it be something that happened in SCE or or the Federation unto itself or even in the Klingon world, which is highly political. Oh, um, yeah. What is what <laughs> out of curiosity is it does it come from a personal intrigue into you know the current state of politics or even historical states of politics a little of both I, I you can always tell I, I tend to go in fits and starts with with political stuff in the real world um, certainly whenever a presidential election comes around suddenly I'm like paying attention to everything <laughs> I, I, I for whatever reason presidential elections just get my t- turn me into a political junkie more than anything else um, but the um, it's something that I'm always I've always been fascinated by is is the how how politics work how people leading other people works how people serving other people works it's it's um you know how how the state treats its people um and what the decisions made by people in power do what effect that has on everyday lives and and what leads somebody to go into that sort of thing um that's just something that's always interested me both in the real world and in fiction and and, and it's something in particular in star trek it's something they haven't really played with very much certainly not in the federation it's i mean we know more about the klingon government than we do about the federation yep. government yep that's yeah. true. um that is true yeah and and it, it, that always that, that always was, struck me as a missed opportunity that was one of the high points for the episode space seed to me was Khan's little statement of politics is you know is warfare concealed yeah, yeah. but yeah. uh you know and, and 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 speaking now we're not giving away any spoilers because the book is still fresh but i have to tell you our our friend david r george the third <laughs> I I love him, but right now I loathe him so much. Uh, in in his defense, he was that was an editorial directive he was given. Oh, so okay. I do that. All right. Uh, okay. That was what that was what that was supposed that was the that came down from on high. It was the basis for this the whole was, theory. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the idea behind it. Um, right. Uh-huh. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. But damn, um, <laughs> and I I wasn't thrilled about it either, but I wasn't insulted either. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, why no, people? Because it would be a spoiler. Yeah. Okay. So will you be I called in to clean up the mess? Probably not. <laughs> uh, um, I uh, I can't really get into yeah. what I want to say without giving away. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you know you probably know the things that we better still to come, right? Uh, only in the vaguest sense. Um, but uh, not not in terms of specific detail. But um, uh, yeah, I told Terry I, I I if it had been a book and not my Kindle, it would have hit the wall. And that's saying something because I'm the one who's known for throwing books against the wall. Yeah. Not, not Nick. Nick is usually pretty calm when it comes to his reading. And when he called me, he goes, I almost threw my Kindle against the wall. I was like, <gasps> and that's what caused me to open up and start reading the third book that I know. <laughs> so, that's what just, but I can sum this up very easily. I'll get you, John Van Sitter. Oh, I'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a personal tête-à-tête. If you guys let's put it this way, if you guys really want to know what the spoiler is, go back and research the Twitter conversations between Nick and John Van Sitter, and then you'll have a <laughs> clue as to what might have happened. <clears throat> so, um, I, I have a question anyway, for you. Yeah, what? Go ahead. No, no, no. What I, were you gonna? Say? I don't remember what I was. <laughs> okay, my question was much more broad, and and the question was going to be of all of the original characters that you've been able to create, which one's your favorite? 
favorite. And why? Just a mean question. <laughs> Which of your children's your favorite, Keith? Yeah, right. You know, really? that's, that's, exactly. Which one do you love the most? I don't know if I could narrow it down. Um, I'm okay. I'll I'll be I'll okay. be. Cl- I'll, 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 I'll give for Federation character. Which one's your favorite Klingon in character? But, uh, <laughs> with with all right with Federation character, it would be a tie. Um, that counts between uh, David Gold <gasps> from the Corps of Engineers series, so awesome. uh, who, who I freely admit is basically Colonel Sherman Potter only Jewish uh, and <laughs> Starfleet. But no, that was what I, that was. The instruction I, I, can't read him right. the same. Oh. I can't read him the same anymore. <laughs> oh my god, he's right. I never would have thought about that, but it's so true. Oh yeah, that, that gold was always, that was how he was envisioned and every time <gasps> a writer came in on the series, what I told him was, if you're writing gold, just picture Harry Morgan. That's that's who he is. Oh uh, my and that's god, I love so much. I really do. You know, you're the first time I ever, ever, ever read gold was in the Captain's Table short. Ah, okay, yeah. And then I was like, oh, I need to know more about this guy. And that's when I found the SCE book. So Good. just to let you know, that sometimes for those of you who aren't sure about the short stories, do yourself a favor. Go buy them. Read them. You'll fall in love with characters and get involved in a whole series of novels you never knew existed. Just saying. <laughs> But what I, what I, the reason, John Wardover and I developed uh, the Corps of Engineers series together um, in uh, June of 2000. And, you know, we were, we were pulling engineer characters from, you know, various guest appearances. Barkley was off limits because at the time we were doing this, he was still uh, being used on Voyager. So we couldn't really use him. Um, but pretty much anybody else was fair game. And uh, we, when we were trying to come up with a captain character, we both kind of agreed that it, we, we, the reason we, why we went with um, Potter as a template was because MASH was, was kind of, uh, in many ways, the template for the series, in that it was a group of specialists, specifically. Which meant they weren't going to be your regular Starfleet types. These are, you know, crazy engineers um, who, who are not going to do things the usual way and are not necessarily going to be spit polish, but will get the job done. And so we went with we went with Potter as our model for the as, as somebody who is a regular Starfleet person, is not any kind of engineer, but is capable of seeing the big picture and also knows when to stand back and let them do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And then, you know, Rain, and then kick them back in bounds when they get a little too crazy. Um, so that was and and I just love the way the character developed um, and and the way the way he got to you know run the well, crew. Well, I also sense. have to I also have to say I really appreciated the fact that he was also a character that for the most part in a lot of Star Trek you never really saw before, and that was it allowed for the existence of um, spirituality, um, which you didn't really get to see out, out, outside of that. And now, mind you, that coming from me, that's saying something. I like the idea that not everything not everything vanished after the Vulcans appeared on Earth that that, <laughs> that there yeah. were st- exactly that there was still some kind of cohesive idea of faith of of humanity and gold really was a great representation of that in showing that it and not just necessarily that that Christian ideal as well but that, that you know hey you know what Jews weren't going to go away and I like the idea that that gold was of that faith and that that was a part of his character and an inherent part of his character too, and I loved it very much. Yes, yeah. and honestly, I mean, people have been trying to get rid of the Jews for millennia, and they're still <laughs> here. And I can't imagine that Utopia would manage it. You know, <laughs> um, no, I think you're right. Yeah, and 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 Judaism is, much, is as much a cultural thing as it is a religious thing, anyhow. And right. uh, and I just I don't I, I don't see it dying out, and I don't see it uh, I don't you know I don't see I don't see the Jewish culture giving up that easily. Um, not not <laughs> after not after all this time. And uh, and it, you know it gave me an opportunity to throw Yiddishisms into the story which is always um, well, but the, 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 the other the other character the other character in addition to Gold would be uh, President Nanbako partly because of where she comes from uh, President Baco was based partly on my great grandmother really uh, yeah her, na- her name was patterned after after that uh, my, my I called my great grandmother Nana so that's where Nan comes from and her last name was De- De- was uh, Debacco and I just knocked the D off for her last name um, uh, she died actually uh, the year that I was writing A Time for War A Time for Peace and, really yeah yeah, or shortly shortly before I started writing a time for a time piece. So when I was creating uh, the character who was going to run for and eventually win the presidency, uh, that was... Um, I was going to say, for a lot of our listeners who don't know who, who uh, Keith is talking about, President President Nanbako is a president of the Federation for several books now. 
And yeah. seriously, Actually, one of, one of, the one things of that my really, favorite character. So. Thank you. Um, one of the things that has really heartened me, I honestly didn't expect the character ever to appear again after Articles of Federation. Really? She, been, she was in A Time For A Time For Peace because I we needed to have a, a new president uh, after after the events of uh, A Time To Kill and A Time To Heal uh, left the presidency empty. Um, and I thought it would be fun to see what an election would be like in the Federation. And then we did Articles of the Federation, which is something that had actually been batting around the, the Simon & Schuster office for years. Uh, was the idea of me doing uh, a Star Trek version of The West Wing. And then that finally came together uh, with that book. But I really didn't think we'd ever see her again after that. Um, you have no idea I, how much I loved Articles of the Federation to the point where I thought you could totally do a whole series from this. And, and I'm not <laughs> kidding. When I say, when I'm, when I, when I'm not kidding, when I'm like, you could do a, a West Wing, a Star Trek West Wing, absolutely. I'm also a firm believer you could probably do like a Star Trek CSI and the Star Trek medical ER. I'm just that way. But I really loved her character and everything that happened Thank in you. close so much that, again, I like the political intrigue. I like finding out how does this affect the greater population of a political group of what happens in, in you know, that bigger picture. What happens when the bigger f- picture affects a smaller group? And I loved articles. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, cool. And then, and then you know, it went, she went and, and she went viral on me basically you know uh <laughs> Uh, Dave, Dave, it's mostly Dave's fault. It was uh, because she was used in the Destiny trilogy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, Dave asked me if I was okay with it. I said, well, yeah. I mean, you know, technically she's not my character. None of them are any of our characters. They're all owned lock, stock, and phaser banks by uh, by, by CBS. I, I, so, um, you know, I, I don't have any claim to her, any legal claim to her and, and only a, a, the weakest of moral claims. So, and I was fine with it. I was like, great, you know. And she wound up playing a very large supporting role in Destiny, which, which thrilled me, and she's been used yeah. a bunch of times since. Uh, so that really, that pleased me no end, that, that she wound up becoming an important character in the 24th century fiction. Um, it, it, it meant a lot to me, you know, especially because she she was patterned after my great-grandmother, who I think would have really appreciated it. Actually, she uh-huh. probably would She actually wouldn't have appreciated it at all. She wasn't... <laughs> But um, and and didn't didn't have much use 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 of or knowledge of science fiction at all. She just would uh, she would have nodded and say, "Oh, that's nice." But those She's those two are very probably, well, oh, but oh. They, he doesn't have dental through the plan yet. Yeah, well, the uh, to, to actually finish I, answering the question you asked about six and a half Klingon, hours ago. Klingon. The, uh, I, my fa- well, most of the Klingon characters I've created, I've used, aren't ones I created. I mean, I didn't create Clag, I didn't create Talk, I didn't create Leskit, um, or Kurak, but um. Probably Probably the one who became my favorite just because she completely took over uh, was Wall, um, the the leader of the 15th Squad. I wanted to show when I was doing the Gorkon books, I wanted to show what what life was like for the ground level troops. So I so I picked the 15th Squad to basically be my POV characters for the grunts, you know, the 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 guys who get beamed down to kill people and get killed on the ground whenever the Klingons invade somewhere. And uh, Wall just completely uh, took over that that element of it to the point where you know she. Basically basically bullied her way into a major subplot in the third book, Enemy Territory. Um, <laughs> you know, I... And, she was and, one of those that stuck with you when you first started oh, as a yeah. writer. Huh? Yeah, I, I just, I really came to love the character a great deal and, and really enjoyed messing around with her and, and creating her, her backstory and all the rest of it. Um, you know, Borak, what's funny is... But, you know, I, I, who else? Uh, Borak, the doctor. I expected her to be important, though, because I really wanted, I was really taken with the idea of having um, a Klingon doctor who was actually trained in the Federation and who was trying to improve the quality of, of Klingon medicine. Mm. Uh, and, and what an incredible uphill battle that would be. So I was expecting her to be an important character. With I think the reason why I'm going with Wall to answer your question is that I wasn't expecting it with her. Yeah, she, those she, are the best. She, the was best. A, she was a breakout character for like a better. She surprised even you, and you created oh, yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. It's because I, I, I had the opportunity tonight and actually the honor of being interviewed by a um, a, a Star Trek Online podcast called uh, Foundry, uh, the, the Foundry Files, I think it is. Oh, the Foundry Roundtable. Excuse me. Sorry, guys. The Foundry Roundtable. And um, I was asked to participate in this discussion in regard to the creation of uh, female characters. 
And the one thing I appreciate about you and as well as many other Star Trek writers, which is why I read Star Trek, is because um, of the fact that a lot of the ways that, oh, no, not a lot of the ways, the way that wi- women and female genders are portrayed in Star Trek novels are exactly the way you would expect them to be, and that is, it's not an issue. Um, where as opposed to a lot of the ways that female characters were written in the shows were, of course, stereotypical in a lot of their um, their genesis. And that's why I, I, I love Nambako. I love your Klingon female characters, again, because they're just part and parcel of the world around them. It's never really made an issue as to what their gender is. And that's kind of what I was trying to express to these gentlemen tonight, which was, if you really want to know what it's like to write a female character, do yourself a favor put your pens down, put your, you know, take your hands away from the keyboard when you're writing a foundry mission and pick up a Star Trek novel. Uh, What is it about, you know, is it, is it direction that you ever got with regards to the way that you write your female characters or is it just natural to you? I, it's something that's always been important to me. Um, I, I, I was, I was raised by a mother who lists her religion as feminism and, (laughs) um, and I was a women's studies minor in, in college and I've always been interested in in um, a lot of a lot of uh, female writers whose voices were lost uh, due to for various reasons. Um, in particular, there were the, I was I was captivated in college by a whole bunch of 19th century female writers who are not considered part of the great literary canon, but who did some amazing work. Um, but were were Mike, and were and were fairly popular. You frightened me because now I'm wondering whether or not you knew my great great grandmother. I don't. So now probably I'll not, have to probably not personally, be. but you know. no, I mean um, of her work. <laughs> but I'll, I'll 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 send you that little tidbit later. So go keep talking. Okay. Keep talking. Um, <laughs> and I've all Sorry. and and, partic- and I think one of the things that appealed to me about Star Trek is that it is at least in theory a world in which you know race doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter. Um, that you know you can have, like I said before, you can have Sulu, you can have an Asian guy, a black woman, and a Russian guy working on the same bridge with the the, the noble white American captain, and nobody comments on it. Nobody even thinks it's that big a deal. On Deep Space Nine, you can have a black guy and an Arab having a conversation that has nothing to do with the fact that one guy's a black guy and one guy's an Arab, and it's not that big a deal. Um, it's the, that, you know, the fact that Janeway was a female captain really wasn't something that was particularly commented on once you got past the silly ma'am discussion in the pilot. Um, mm-hmm. That The fact that she was female wasn't a big deal. Um, she, she was the gap. She just happened to have boobs, you know. Um <laughs> It's true, though. The yeah, yeah, and that and that and I, and I, it's one of the things I've always liked about Star Trek. Having said that, they don't, they didn't always do that as well as I'd like. It, it, I realized something. Uh, I was doing a panel at Dragon Con on writing strong female characters. I was the token male on the panel, and um, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things I realized was that of all the fictional Federation presidents that have been created in Star, that have been seen in Star Trek fiction, whether on screen or in comic books or in novels. Um, all of the presidents that have been established that were female, I, I was the one who established them. Um, Paco is the, the the biggest one, but all the others were ones that, you know, past presidents I mentioned in Articles of Federation. In the only other, there have been other female uh, presidents that have been mentioned in uh, uh, various role-playing games. FASA had a whole list of presidents for one of their uh, one of their RPGs, uh, some of whom were also female, although not as many as I would have liked, but at least they had some. Um, but all the presidents that, that we've seen, I mean, certainly we only saw three, yeah, three on screen. Um, the 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 unnamed guy in Star Trek IV, um, the equally unnamed guy in Star Trek VI, and um, Jarashinio in Deep Space Nine, all were male. And yep. um, the uh, the there were very a few novels here and there established various Federation presidents, all male. And Enterprise also established that Jonathan Archer was was a Federation president at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that was that was it uh, until until I came around with with the time for War, a time for peace. We'd never seen a female Federation president in any of the of the fiction. Which really kind of annoyed me. <laughs> I realized it. Um, and there's no reason for it. You know, one of the, the one of the things that's really, that, that, that Star Trek generally, at least in the abstract does well, is not have that big, be a big... Um, that's it. That's it, was, it. It was, it was, it was observed, it was not always observed in the breach as often as it should have been. Although I will, I will give them credit, uh, if, if to, to once again sing the praises of Deep Space Nine. Um, one of the things I really admired about the show was that um, the conversations Kira and Dax would have, many of them would pass the Bechdel test. Um, for those who don't know, the Bechdel... Uh, I was Allison just going to ask you uh, about Space Nine with that. Thank you so much, Bechdel yeah. test is, but thank you. Yes, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Bechdel, uh, Alison Bechdel, who's a cartoonist, uh, 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 for her, 
a, the test of two two female characters having a conversation that is not about the men in no one, right. which is a lot rarer than you'd think. Um, but Deep Space Nine passed that on a regular basis. Uh, yeah. Not always, you know. I mean, the the I just watched um, for the rewatch. I just did uh, part one of the the Maquis two parter, and Kira and Dax are having a conversation about uh, Captain Baudet, the uh, the the Gallimite captain who, who, whose brain you can see because he has a secret head. Um, mm-hmm. who's, who's a character that I'm really grateful we never actually saw. On- saw. <laughs> But, uh, well, honestly, it was funnier that way. You know, it's much better to use it's your true. imagination, somebody like that. <laughs> but uh, the, the that was that was a rare case of a, of a Dax Kira conversation that did not pass the Bechdel test. You know, just it before that was um, Bechdel test, but at the same time was not offensive in the fact that oh, no, least, not at all. it was still true to character. I I, oh, I am uh, as feminist as they come, and I would like yeah, that still it, it's not unlike a, an O'Brien um, Bashir conversation. <laughs> right. I I always thought of those two women together as being not un. Uh, it's dissimilar as to O'Brien Bashir in their friendship. It was, it was, it was, it was actually, actually, that's one of the, one of the fun things rewatching Deep Space Nine is watching the early years when they, when O'Brien really, really couldn't stand Bashir at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, which you forget about when you're looking back on it, you know. Uh, yeah, very true. What very. you mostly remember is the friendship, but when it started out, man, he, O'Brien really couldn't stand the guy. Um, and, you know, neither could anybody else. Uh, but, the same reason. But, uh, the, actually, it's funny. One of, uh, the first, uh, one of the first uh, uh, DS9 stories uh, that I wrote was for the, 20, the 10th anniversary anthology Prophecy and Chain in uh, 2003. Um, mostly DS9 was very good about picking up uh, plot threads. One thing they never picked up on, to my surprise, was um, in uh, Hippocratic Oath when O'Brien basically um, disobeyed orders and forced Bashir into a position where he couldn't help out uh, some Jem Hadar who were not addicted to the, Jesh- the Ketrasel right. White. And that was a serious. I mean, that, uh, this was after the point where they had become friends, and there was an obvious issue there at the end of the episode. And then they never followed up on it. You know what? You're right. Um, and but and, character-wise, like, that's something that Bashir probably wouldn't have let go. He was such a yeah. trap shop character, yeah. Yeah, and so I did I did a story for the, for Prophecy and Change, which was called uh, Broken Oaths, uh, which basically had Dax being a Yenta uh, with the two of them, uh, <laughs> and, and dragging Worf into it very reluctantly, uh, where the two of them were basically trying to figure out uh, what was going on between the two of them, and, and eventually, you know, talking out the issue uh, to the point where they where they reconcile the friendship. But that, that moment never happened. It's like uh, the next several episodes after Hippocratic Oath, we did, the two of them weren't together for for whatever reason they just the plot didn't put them in this place working together but and then eventually when we did see them together everything was back to normally which was you know on next gen nobody would have commented on that you know um but right. on space nine it stood out so amazing no, yeah no you're 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 very very right um now as far as now we talked about the characters the original characters that you've been able to kind of create um let's talk and about the characters <laughs> And and well, let's talk about the characters that already existed. Um, you know, I I know we've already gone through what we already called our what did we call them, Nick? Our, our James Lipton questions. Our what? Are you talking about the James Lipton questions? Yeah, those Lipton. We've already done those with Keith. Yes. So I well, I, I, I had a question. Okay. Since since we have you here, and since <laughs> it's been a pretty hot button topic now for several months, I'd love to hear your views on Into Darkness. I most of my views. Views are available online at tor.com. I reviewed. <laughs> Nice out. He's a oh, pro, true. ladies I, and gentlemen. It's a, no, it's also a good plug. We understand that. Yeah. That's good. Um, basically, uh, what I said in the review uh, when the movie came out uh, is I went in with very low expectations. Uh, I was expecting a very um, visually exciting, very well-acted movie with a script that would be dumber than a box of hammers. And <laughs> that's pretty much what I got. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I I have I have observed the career of Roberto or- Orchi and Alex Kurtzman since they were baby writers on Xena back in the late 90s. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the, they're capable of writing fun, entertaining scripts that don't necessarily make a lot of sense, um, which can work when you're doing Xena or when you're doing, for example, Hawaii Five-0, which they helped develop, uh, and which actually worked pretty good on um, uh, yeah. Sleepy Hollow earlier this week, which I right. thought was wonderful, cheesy fun. Um, I'm not necessarily sure it works for Star Trek, but... Um, but 
but you know, like I said, I got I got exactly what I expected out of the movie. Uh, whatever its flaws in terms of plot and sense, uh, the acting was superb. Um, yep. I, I Benedict Cumberbatch is another one like John Vickery and J.G. Herzog, who I could listen read to the phone book, uh, yep. much less uh, act in a part. And what was really impressive was that he acted everybody off the screen, and this was not an easy thing to accomplish because there's some good actors there. He was, you know, I mean, Chris Pine. <laughs> That's exactly it, right. These are these are not exactly, you know, this isn't a high school repertory company he's playing against, and yet he blew all of them away. Yeah. Uh, I said in my review actually that it's it's a it, it shows what an excellent actor Martin Freeman is that he doesn't allow him to do that on Sherlock. Um, wow! But he uh, he just completely owned that movie. Yeah, uh, I also to to give credit to another British actor, uh, one of my favorite performances actually in that film was by uh, Noel Clark, and I'm blanking on the name of the woman who played his wife. Um, it was a very small part, but they uh, the 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 parents of the kids, the parents who were of healed, the child, yes, right, who were who were, who were oh, healed no. by Con, by Con's uh, uh, magic blood, and um, <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm watching this. And I says, okay, they're going to use the magic blood at the end of the movie to save somebody's life, and right. sure enough, but um, the the two of them played that beautifully. That scene where you know they get up and they they take the train to the hospital and they're and they're staring at the kid and just with no dialogue at all, uh-huh. the the sheer uh-huh. despair and helplessness that they're feeling came across so beautifully. Yeah, um, and and that that's a credit not only to the actors but also to Abrams. I mean, he direct you know that that that's on the director too. Abrams has a way of being able to direct the most powerful first ten minutes of a film I've ever seen. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, opening. He's always been good at opening shots. So, although I still, I still don't know why the hell the Enterprise was underwater. That uh, that bug. But yeah, it, it, right. it, it, the only reason it was underwater was so they could film the scene of it coming out of the water. That was really. <laughs> You know, it's, it's like it's like Roddenberry's old joke. Why don't they Why don't they have seatbelts on the Enterprise? Because then they can't fall out of their chairs. And, and the only um, reason why the, the Enterprise actually fell out of the sky and back into Earth's atmosphere so it could rise back itself up because the, the first shot out of the Titan uh, in 2009 was so popular they had to do it again in the next movie. I understand this. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I mean, it was it was a fun way to kill a couple hours. Um, I I <laughs> you know, like I said, the the it was worth it. It was worth going just to watch the acting craft at work there, not just Cumberbatch, but also. So uh, Simon Pegg and Carl Urban in particular were, were oh, superb. superb. Um, uh, I, I I really thought they did an excellent work. Um, and you know, it's if nothing else, these two films have got people. And by people, I don't mean like the four of us because we're we're we were kind of already there. It's gotten the general public interested in Star Trek to an extent this that they true. weren't yeah. after ten years of Very bad true. Voyager episodes, bad Enterprise episodes, and bad Next Gen movies, um, which is you know pretty much from the, basically the 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 first decade of the millennium or so that was all we got yeah. you know um, you know Insurrection was was awful uh, you know Deep Space Nine went off the air in 99 Voyager was uh, not re- was not never really lived up to its premise um, and Enterprise was just was uh, and, and Enterprise is the only modern Star Trek series to fail in the marketplace yeah. so you know and it's such and it's such a heartbreaker too because it had such potential and and I'm, I guess I, I'm, I, I see I look at it I've I only was, seen it go ahead I, I was always is kind of iffy about Enterprise in the first place because I never thought yeah. the idea of prequel was a good idea. Especially if you're trying to do something that takes place before the original series, where when you look at the technology in the original series, once you remove the transporter and the warp drive, mm-hmm. the, enter- the Enterprise that Kirk was on was less technologically advanced than your average Manhattan office building right now. <laughs> Um, True. <laughs> you know, and, and to, to, to have to come up with technology that's, on the one hand, more advanced than what we have in our hands right now, but less advanced than the, the flashy lights. Yeah. You know, and the cell phones, just, right. Yeah. And it's just, it, it just struck me as asking for trouble. And and prequels are always a, a, a tough thing to do anyhow um, and, and pull off right. I think they would have been better off just doing what Next Gen did, which was jumping ahead. You know? yeah. Do you think that, that we'll ever see, do you think we'll see a new series? Not for a while. I think they want to keep it as a movie for a while, but I don't, I, I, I think we might eventually. Um, it, it still may be a few more years. Four more years. Do you think they're going to go ahead yeah, in the Prime think, Universe? Do you think we're going to go jump ahead in the alternate, uh, alternate? I really don't know. I, and I'm <laughs> in a position to judge. I, I have no insider information on it. And I, I, oh, I'm not asking for that. What do you think would work best? Oh, what I think would work best? I honestly, and this goes back to before uh, they brought in Abrams, I think that what the best thing to do would to be a series of miniseries. You know, maybe yeah. maybe on cable, maybe, maybe, you know, syndicated or whatever, you know, and through whichever Hell, maybe even do it like through Netflix or something. Basically, doing a series of miniseries that take place in whatever time they feel like. It. Do a miniseries involving Riker on the Titan. Do a miniseries involving Sulu on the Excelsior. Do a miniseries involving Klingons. Do you know a new you, ship? Excuse me, I have to get a towel. Yeah. I have. <laughs> 
<laughs> a shamwow. Yeah, well. Shamwow. Just, yeah, you know, a couple, couple really, minutes really a year. I really like that idea. Yeah, I like uh, that I got. I noticed and, and this, that. And it also, it would enable you to do things that you wouldn't be able to do as a regular, like, one of the reasons why they couldn't real. it would be difficult to do a Klingon show is you've got to put everybody in makeup every freaking day, right. uh, and that, that gets expensive. Right. Um, but for a six-part miniseries, you can do Not that. So much. You know, it, it, it's easier to, to justify that expense. Perhaps and it's just, you know, I mean, it's a horrible thing to have to do. I mean, you know, it, it's bad enough that one or two actors have to do it to make, you know, an entire cast do it, including, like, the extras. I, I mean, I remember when, when Michael Dorn came on to Deep Space Nine, one of the conditions for which under which he would join up was if they made they guaranteed that his makeup would only take a certain amount of time because, you know, he'd already done that for seven years in a couple movies. And it changed the pigment of his skin. Yeah, yeah. I um, can understand. <laughs> I can understand but, but being a little... Un- yeah. Phase from the set was um, when they did uh, Apocalypse Rising, which was the one where Cisco, O'Brien, and Odo all had to disguise themselves Klingon. And Avery Brooks apparently loved it. He thought it was really cool and, and fun. For Rene Aubergenois, it was... And Michael Dorn, it was just another day at the office. It was just, you know, different makeup from right. what I usually did. Cole Meany apparently bitched and moaned and complained constantly and was getting no sympathy from anybody, especially not <laughs> from, from, from the guys who had to do it all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can I can see that. I can understand that. Yeah. Well, when I mean, you've never had to deal with it before and the only yeah. makeup that you've had to deal with was my, maybe a little powder to keep the shine down. Basically, yeah. Yeah, he never, yeah, meaning never Perhaps, had. Perhaps with your miniseries idea, we could finally get the thoughtful examination and do for the first canon villain of Star Trek. Of course, I speak of the Romulan Empire. Oh, I thought you were talking about Gary Mitchell. Oh, touche. Nicely done. <sighs> first recurring. Sunk. <laughs> you shut up. <laughs> Sunk. Technically, I'll sink you. technically, they're not the first recurring because they didn't really become recurring until the third season. They were still there and then came back, so they were recurring. Yeah, but they didn't become recurring like, until later. Klingons, Klingons actually been... recurred first. Yeah. Because, because they were easier to make fun of. Look at the funny Chinese people. That's what they were doing. <laughs> Shit. And that's so what they were the doing. Show. There so goes the GNT right, right no. down the shitter, as always. No, Dick. look what they did with their skin. Mm-hmm. They they made it like a golden and I they know. had look, Asian type to, features. Yeah, it's true. It is true. And a private little war is a perfect example of, of using the Asian motif with them. Yeah. And yes. the Romulan were awesome. Russian. Awesome. They were more Romans, really. I mean, they had a name. <laughs> Terry, Terry, the, Romulus and Remus, the, Terry, the you're really... That they had, all. Okay. And, and they had ridiculous... And in their first appearance, they had ridiculous helmets. You know, it was... And uh, Terry turns into to Chekhov. Do you notice that? Every... Right. The Roman Empire and the original Mother Russia. You know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I think... Of, now, because, have you read these sort of voyages? Chinese, I think of them as Japanese. And and I... Yeah, I, I do think of the of Romulan Empire as being more Cold War Russian than anything. So, there... Well, that follows Put through you the in your whole place, submarine. Right? No, but that, <laughs> so, that follows through with the whole submarine thing of Balance of Terror. That yeah. that that would be a very you know Russian very U.S. Navy analogy for the time. Yeah, I mean it was a, it was but, a, it was basically a World War II submarine, but yeah, it was awesome uh, too. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I I somebody uh, I think it was Zach Stentz, uh the screenwriter, uh, recently mentioned on Twitter that uh, Mark Leonard doesn't get nearly enough credit for, oh, or so specifically true. that character doesn't get enough credit as one of the great Star Trek villains because he really was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, even even good. more so than 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 Khan. Uh, no. He really was one of the great adversaries, one of the most worthy adversaries for Kirk. I honestly think that the that I I mean yes, Ricardo Montalban is awesome, but I honestly thought that of of the various you know counterparts and bad guys and such that um, uh, Kirk faced, I thought the two best were the Romulan Sarek's Romulan commander and uh, and Kang. Uh, yeah. I love Kang. One, one of the Kang. reasons, yeah, me too. One he, of the reasons why Day of the Dove worked was because Kang was very much Kirk's counterpart and equal. Equal. It, it, Absolutely, I agree. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry. The, be, the gravitas of, of, of Michael and Sarah comes through when Kirk says, you know, this is Captain Kirk, you know, lay down your arm with it. And then Kang, oh, this is Kang, cease hostilities. Yeah. And everybody listens to him. Yeah. I still remember as a kid, the first time I saw that, I was like, that dude's so cool. Honestly, like, the reason the reason why I became the Klingon obsessed nut job that I am today is mostly <laughs> from, from basically being totally blown away by Michael and Sarah at a young age, you know, seeing 
Day of the Dove as a kid. And, um, and that's he a, was just you know that you know this that, guy is awesome. I you know that was basically what got turned me into into a Klingon fan. That's also a rough episode with Chekhov and Kang's wife. That's yeah. that's that was pretty pretty heavy stuff for prime time ni- late 1960s television. Yeah, it was hey, attempted rape. You know that's what the second attempted rape on Star Trek actually. Uh, yeah, at least and there was Char- a few because Charlie X. I mean, uh, uh, not Charlie X. Um, well, you can also the enemy with Kirk, you know, yeah. Kirk yeah. in on that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the enemy for then. Yes, exactly. evil Kirk. Thank you. Yes. Keith, have you read These Are the Voyages? Um, By, uh, oh, Mark Fishman. Yeah. No, no. Mark Fishman, oh, you haven't seen those yet. Yeah, they're, no, they're I haven't. wild. Okay, it I, is. I, don't, I don't know what it is. I, I... Oh, goodness. Now we can it, tell you. It's the first of his three books that he's done. And, and the, the analogy I came up with that he actually liked when we interviewed him in Vegas, it's his Ken Burns documentary in written form of the three seasons of the original series. He had 80, what was it, Terry, 80, 90 boxes? It was like 75 or 80 boxes of uh, memos every, and internal, every every single thing that was issued by Desi Lu to Paramount wow. and vice versa. Okay. And G- Gene Roddenberry uh, actually asked him to write this book before he died. Okay, so, that was 20 years ago. It took him so long. Well, 70 <laughs> some odd boxes plus the opportunity to do so. And of well, course, yeah. And then and the interview, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was being unnecessarily snide there. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> Because Keith's saying, I, I'd like to write that book. Yeah, we all did. <laughs> there, was a, there is an end. Yeah, there. I should try that sometime. Be in the same room with those 70 boxes. Are you kidding? Yeah. And, and it's it's amazing. Okay. I mean, it, it's dense but readable. You know what I mean? It's like a Ken Burns documentary. You're going to get something in every page. Um, and, so, yeah. So, so if you get the opportunity, I, mean, I, I have to admit, I kind of have been sucked in. And that's the number three book I'm in the middle of right now. So. Uh-huh. Oh, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I, I really had to hear about that. I, uh... Especially with, uh, uh, again, especially with somebody who has that experience like you have, which is writing Star Trek and, and having that, that kind of third party um, connection to it. And and, and, you know. and, and like, you, like you were saying earlier about the the, the mythology of, of Gene Roddenberry and, and, you know, the mythology being a good word. And, and, and this really, shoot, wow, there's a lot of holes he shoots in the mythology of Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> but not in a bad way. But you know, he he sets the record straight on a lot of things. And you know, one of the big things is that Gene's rewriting of a lot of great authors that were writing scripts and going yeah, in and that's, just that's that's the short definition of executive producer. I mean, that, that's right. Not, that's not unusual. That that goes on. I mean, honestly, I uh, uh, John Ordover and Dave Mack collaborated on a couple of Deep Space Nine uh, stories. They they wrote mm-hmm. script for Starship Down and they did the story for uh, It's Only a Paper Moon. It's Only a Paper Moon. Yeah. And I read the script that they turned in for Starship Down. I saw Starship Down. The two of them bear very little resemblance to it. Well, I mean, it's the yeah. same. But and the Paper script, Moon was originally like Cheers, wasn't it? Yeah, Paper Moon, Paper Moon had a very long and complicated history. Which it, that isn't my story to tell. That that's right. Kind of <laughs> but um, we'll bug but, him. Um, yeah, but the but they but the thing is, John and Dave still have sole credit for that, which is nice because it means they get all the money for it. Um, but it was also it was significantly rewritten by the writing staff because that's what writing staffs on TV shows do with freelancer scripts. That's always been what, what right, right. writing staff do. So so the fact that Roddenberry rewrote famous people, that was his job description. You know, that was that that you know that that was what he was supposed to be doing. Or if he wasn't doing it, Gene Kuhn was doing it, you know. And John um, D. F. Black, yeah. Yeah. I mean I, uh, David Gerald is very upfront in his Trouble with Tribbles book about how much even though, you know, David got all the credit for got all the, the sole writing credit, but how much Trouble with Tribbles owed to Gene Kuhn. You know, and his his notes and his yeah. rewrites and his suggestions You're and right. such were were you know, and he, he's 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 always from from jump very upfront. That was actually me. You know, I was a little kid. My first exposure to that reality of, of television production, um, which is just something I wasn't. You know, I was just a dumb kid. I didn't know any better. You know, I was reading reading David's book uh, and learning just how you know how much work was done by the the writing staff and and the editorial process. Yeah, we had the the amazing chance. We we, we did a supplemental log with David Gerald, and wow, just it, it was amazing. Just it was a you fun. Know. That was a that was yeah. a very fun I, I don't doubt it. David's a great guy. <laughs> we had a, a very good time, just like we're having with you. And I just have to say thank you so, so much for joining us again. And I'm I, if I had the opportunity, I would keep you on the phone for hours. <laughs> I really I know Keith, you have no idea because it's talking it's talking to it's not an interview. It's more of a conversation. And you're just such a, a, a comfortable person to speak with. And we thank yeah, you. Not like that Dayton Ward. Ass. <laughs> Jeez. Well, 
Well, yeah, but you know, what are you going to do? He's a, he's no, he's no, he's no Dillmore. Let me tell you that. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, did we lose you, honey? For those, for those that don't know, if, if you get the chance to go to a convention where Keith is at, it, it, it is a, a shitload of fun. And if it wasn't for Keith, I would not have spent six hours at a bar with John Billingsley and his beautiful bride. Oh. There you go. Ke- yeah. Kelly, Kelly Manning and I had so much fun. Have, yeah, I was going to say, out of curiosity, do you have any appearances coming up? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to be... Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure when this podcast is going live. Um, Next week. Okay. Wednesday. Uh, uh, okay, then then there's no point in mentioning RockCon because by the time this goes live, I'll, I'll have done it already. Um, was but, it good? Uh, I'm sure it was fantastic. Um, <laughs> the uh, it was great, best convention ever. Uh, we can brag we can brag at the convention for you. There you go. The uh, the well, um, JG Hertzler is going to be one of the guests actor. Has been one of the guests there. Uh, and uh, as I step into the way back, the um, the next the next uh, uh, appearance, I'm going to be at um, New York Comic Con uh, it, at the Javits Center in New York City. Uh, that's my local convention. Um, the podcast that I'm involved with the Chronic Rift, as well yep. as my own podcast, Dead Kitchen Radio, we're going to have a couple of tables in the podcast area at the Javits Center. Uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be selling books. Uh, we're going to be doing interviews and stuff. We're also going to have, um, uh, for at least part of the weekend, we're going to have a face painter and a balloon twister there. Uh, Sweet! No, that's yeah. awesome. Now, t- t- I don't know if Terry knows. Uh, is your is your little singing group going to be there? No, the Boogie Nights aren't going to be there. Uh, the the uh, we're not we're not we're not big enough for New York County. But um, <laughs> the uh, but I will be I will be selling and autographing copies of my books and we're also uh, going to be interviewing people for the for the podcast uh, we got uh, we got a ton of interviews last year uh, in fact we did we did interviews with both Dave Mack and Christopher Bennett uh, talking about their stuff we got to get Christopher Bennett on okay. yeah you should um, yeah. really should he's easy enough to find you know just yeah. drop him an email um, and uh, he uh, Christopher is going to be at New York Comic Con he's actually crashing at our apartment when he's here and nice. um, the uh, I'm going to be there I'm going to be doing uh, out in New Jersey uh, at um, oh damn I can't remember the damn library. It's a uh, celebration of Deep Space Nine's 20th anniversary. Uh, Very cool. It's Hang on, it's here somewhere. He's flipping through his book. That's cool. Flipping through my email, actually trying to find <laughs> it again. Thanks. Um, it's on October 26th, I can tell you that much, um, at the Morris County Library uh, in New Jersey. Really? Yeah. I might have to go to that because that's my birthday weekend, so that would be awesome. Oh, really? And my grandmother lives in, in Lincroft, so... You could totally oh, cool. drive. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be all day at the, at the Morris County Library... Uh, they're going to show uh, four episodes of Deep Space Nine, mm-hmm. uh, two of which will be two episodes you absolutely have to show if you're going to show episodes of Deep Space Nine, which are The Visitor and Trials and Tribulations, uh, which I think are both excellent choices. Uh, that's again, and I'm going to be doing a, a one-hour talk uh, on the show and on stuff. I'll be selling them. Um, I'm going to be at the Collings actually uh, beginning of October, October 5th. I'm going to be at the Collingswood Book Festival in Collingswood, New Jersey. Uh, Dark Quest Books, who is the publisher of my precinct novels, uh, always has a booth at Collingswood, and I'm going to have a corner of it uh, selling stuff. And and uh, I'm going to be at PhilCon in Cherry Hill, New Jersey um, in the middle of November. Um, and I think that's all my appearances this year. Next year, I'll be I'll be at Farpoint, which is where I was responsible for Nick hanging out with John Billingsley last year. Um, and that'll be in February in, uh, in the Baltimore area, Ammonium, uh, Maryland, just north of Baltimore. <laughs> and uh, I'm doing other stuff next year as well. I'm, I'm hoping to do a bunch of conventions I haven't done in a while or don't normally do be, in order to push the Klingon Art of War, particularly once May rolls around. Um, well, you, Very cool. that would be really awesome. You make sure that you let us know when those are going to be, and we'll make sure that our listeners are aware of when you Absolutely. might be able to be uh, contacted. That'd be great. Yeah, okay. And you can find me online at decandido.net. That's my last name, D-E-C-A-N-D-I-D-O.net. It is a cheerfully retro webpage, um, <laughs> which which basically, it, lo- it looks like it was designed by somebody who learned HTML in 1996 and never learned anything after that. That's because it was designed by a guy who learned HTML in 1996 and never learned anything after that. <laughs> Uh, to with me, um, but it, uh, it basically serves as a gateway to where else you can find me. Uh, at, if you go to decanzado.net, there are ordering links for my most recent and upcoming fiction. So you, from there, you can order Ragnarok and Roll, which is my urban fantasy short story collection set in Key West, Florida. You can order the precinct novels. You can pre-order the Klingon Art of War. You can get my leverage novel. Um, and then it also has links to my podcasts, my blog, my Facebook page, my Twitter feed, the TNG and Next and DS9 uh, rewatch on Tor.com uh, and bunches of other things. So um, that's basically sort of the clearinghouse for all things crad. Yeah. And again, uh, well, I know that the one thing that you already just mentioned, but I will just say is that you can follow him on Twitter at K-R-A-D-E-C-K-R-A-D. Yes. 
yeah, he, and then there's a link. There's a, there's a link there to Candido Dutch. So. It's awesome, and um, he's he's always really fun to follow on Twitter. So I've been I the last couple of weeks I've been tweeting as much. I've been busy. I That's miss nothing. your I, I miss your Yankees tweets. Yeah, I I lo- part of it is the season has been really dreadful, and part of it is I lost uh I lost my gig uh writing for the Pinstripe Bible. Um, oh. Preston, Preston annoyed me. Um, so that uh yeah they decided they weren't going to pay people to write anymore uh, yeah. oh jesus yeah and and to to coin a phrase shakespeare's got to get paid um <laughs> and god knows i'm not shakespeare but i still you know the principle remains <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we understand, don't we, Michael? Yes, yes we do. We do. <laughs> Mike, Mike, you are doing so good, right? Now. For those that don't, Mike has given up smoking, so he's really, oh. he's he's a warrior in 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 a warrior in Pon Far. Really, is what it <laughs> comes down to. <laughs> He's been arch. Just don't mess with me tonight. <laughs> Notice even I'm being seriously, nice to him. Seriously, man, good luck with that. that, that Thank you. Um, I do want to you uh, save yourself a great deal of money. Yes, them things is expensive. Yes, yeah. they are. Uh, but I would like to take a moment to remind everybody, our audience, um, that on October 26th um, we have a uh, book club, and on October 26th we will be discussing uh, IKA Scorecon, a good day to die. So uh, be sure to start uh, to. Pick Pick it up, read it, and look, we look forward to discussing it. Oh, so nice little shout out, and of course, uh, pre-order Klingon Art of War. I did. That's right. A couple and, that, and, that was awesome. I did. <laughs> and even better is that if Terry will get all cranky if you don't go to the gntshow.com website first and then use the, the link to the Amazon pre-order. <laughs> Through our site. <laughs> Absolutely shameless. I How am did you two, Where did you two ever learn to be such plug whores? I am I disgusted am a, a, and appalled uh-huh. and, and so proud because I used to be. And one. it's your turn to plug. Uh, I have. Uh, I have. Not, well, Kelly Metting's book. Uh, <laughs> Strike City, there you go. her uh, Requiem for the Dead just came out. Love you, so, Kelly. So, so go order it. She's one of my favorite people. Again, using the GNT. Like Kelly is good people. Yeah. She is yeah. good. That's right. She's a good writer and wonderful. And I have yet to start her book, but I have three of them sitting right there. Well, Keith, I'll, I'll admit to you, I've got all your Gorkon books on my Kindle, but those are waiting for a deployment because I, I know I will have several books in a row right there to read when I can't do- download anything else for a while. Oh, one other question. Okay. I wanted to ask you. Yeah. SCPD. Yes. Please. Are we having more? That is, it, it's in the long-term plan. Um, okay. There's basically, uh, the book hasn't been particularly successful, so I'm trying to look at ways of, of so continuing fun. the series in a way that um, will be more successful than the way I tried. Um, so, it was so fun. This thank you. I, 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 am, I, am, <laughs> I, I definitely, I, I will be coming back to that universe uh, at some point in what form still to be determined, but, um, and it may even be just another novel through Crossroads, or it may be some. So um, where did your, no, okay, now this is just going to go on to another question and then is where okay. did you because uh, apparently you just have a thing for procedurals and I really do um, I, I I blame a misspent youth watching Barney Miller and Hill Street <laughs> Sweet. Okay. No said. That, if there's that, a fish in there somewhere, I'll be fine. Uh, not as such, but um, <laughs> although there is there is uh, one character in uh, uh, Dragon Precinct who uh, his starting point at the very least uh, was being modeled after John Munch. Oh. Specifically, Homicide's version of John Munch, not that unrecognizable guy on SVU with his name. <laughs> Um, but, uh, that, um, and then for that matter, there's a character in SCPD who's, uh, uh the character of, uh, Peter McAvoy at least is, is, I, I, at the very least view him as being played by Richard Belzer. Even. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> That's awesome. And you do, you just, it's just something because, you know, were you a Rockford Files fan at all? You know, I never got into Rockford. It was never something I watched. It just, not, not on never. purpose. I just never got into it. Yeah. Not, not even Ricky Brockovich. <laughs> Um, although, although enough people, it, it's similar enough to shows I do like um, yeah. that I really feel like I should watch it. Um, <laughs> particularly, I know I know people who who are fans of Leverage, uh, including <sighs> the creator, the, the creator of the show, uh, John Rogers, uh, co-creator of the show, uh, is, was a huge uh, John Rogers is a huge Rockford fan, and um, and uh, you know it, it it seems to be in the, in a similar vein. So I I, I there's only like, you know mind you there's only two other there's only two other shows I've ever purchased tie-in novels 
Wolves from, and it's been Warehouse 13 and Leverage. Oh. And I, and because I, I love those shows both so much. And, uh, so yeah, you just, you just, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm a bad person. I have not actually, I have Greg Cox's Warehouse 13 novel and Greg's and Matt Forbeck's Leverage novels sitting in my TBR pile. I haven't gotten. Yeah, they're good. They're but fun. I would like to. I, I mean, obviously I've read my Leverage novel because I wrote it, yeah. but, um, uh, but I haven't read the other. Oh, wow. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for talking to us about everything that you're up to, up against and up with and up uh, around and doing. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of all and about. And, yes. and, and yet at the same time, thank you so much for, for talking to us about Star Trek because we know that it's been a long time since you've written some of the novels, but we're just so happy to see you back in, in around the, the IP. Well, it's, it's we like definitely love your very, work. Very, very much yeah, so. The work that you have. Thank you. Done. Thank and you. It's, a lot of it is still it's relevant. Right. We, we <laughs> talk about it. We... <laughs> thank no you, Nick. <laughs> But yes, thank you again, and uh, it's always it's been a pleasure to, to sit down and talk with you finally. And this is yet another supplemental log brought to you by your friends at the GNT Show. Remember, Mike, where is our uh, our GoFundMe? Our GoFundMe is currently at three hundred and eighty dollars <laughs> out of six. Oh my God, that's amazing! Thank you, thank you guys, and hello to our friends on Trek Radio and Black Star Radio, as well as as well as Radio Star. Yes. All right, Terry. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you, Keith. Welcome. Kapla. Cilantro. Push the button, Frank. <laughs> GNT Show is a busy little beaver production. Music for the GNT Show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation.